Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave. Our journey through pre-Socratic philosophy has led us from the Milesians, through Pythagoras and Xenophanes, to the big debate between Parmenides and Heraclitus, and then to those who responded to them, namely Empedocles and Anaxagoras. So far so good, it seems. However, when I began to research Melissus, it appears that I was wrong about something. Specifically, I was wrong about Parmenides, or I was partially wrong. I oversimplified his position in my original video, and so I'm going to re-examine him alongside Melissus. So let's start with Melissus' life. He is a relatively obscure philosopher. In many summaries of pre-Socratic philosophy, he is skipped, or he is only barely mentioned in passing. Also, we know very little about his life. He was born on the island of Samos, which is the same place where Pythagoras was from, and he seems to have lived there all his life. He was born around perhaps maybe 500 BC, and he was the commander of the navy of Samos at around 440 BC when he defeated the Athenian fleet. According to some, this was for the second time even. At this time he must have been around 60 years old. According to some estimates, he may have written his main philosophical work sometime after that, so maybe around 430 BC. So if there are any grey heads among my listeners, it is never too late to pick up philosophy. He wrote one book, and the name of this book was On Nature, because <laughs> of course it is. Oh wait a second, there is a second half to the title. The full title of his book was On Nature or on what is. However, the book is sadly lost and survives only in a handful of quotes and references. Because of course it does. So what do these surviving quotes and references tell us about Melissus? Now the first thing that you'll read about Melissus is that he was a student of Parmenides. Remember Parmenides? Whatever is, is, change is impossible, etc. That guy. Yeah, so Melissus, along with Zeno from the Paradoxes, are traditionally seen as two students of Parmenides, both finding new and creative ways to promote, explain and defend their teacher's theories. And that is roughly how I treated Zeno as well in my video about him. His paradoxes were basically an explanation or a defense of Parmenides' theory about the impossibility of change. Similarly, Melissus can be viewed, and is often viewed, as doing the exact same thing. However, not by inventing imaginative paradoxes, but by constructing logical arguments. For, you see, he was one of the first to write not in poetry, but in simple prose. And he might have been the first to write logical arguments to defend his position. Here, look at this argument in fragment 1. Whatever was has always been and will always be. For, if it had come into being, then it must have been nothing before it came into being. And if it was at some point nothing, then it is impossible that it could have come into being out of nothing. You see the logical connections? For, if, then, etc. This is one of the first times, and perhaps even the very first time, a philosopher applies some form of formalized logic to prove his conclusion. A method for reasoning refined by Aristotle and applied by many today. Also, this argument seems to really support one of the key principles of Parmenides, right? Namely, that change is impossible and that nothing can be created or destroyed. Is there more evidence for this? Well, yes, I'm glad you asked. According to Melissus, the reality that is, is not just eternal, ungenerated and indestructible, as we've read in fragment 1, it is also indivisible, changeless, motionless, unlimited, infinitely extended and one. Alright, okay, so what seems to be the problem here? Clearly, this guy was either trained or, at the very least, inspired by Parmenides and he now uses logical arguments to support Parmenides' worldview. So why did I say that I was wrong? Well, the problem starts 
with the assumption that we know exactly what Primality's view of reality is. But do we? Yes, of course, we have his lovely poem. But poetry can be tricky to understand, due to its imagery and complex way of expressing thoughts. In fact, if you read his poem or listen to his poem, and you go back and you watch my video on Parmenides, you can be forgiven for wondering, where did he get all that from? Was all of that present in the poem I just heard, or did it just go over my head? Well, I'm sure some things went over your head, and also, some things were likely lost in translation. But your instincts wouldn't be entirely off either, because this traditional view on Parmenides has been heavily influenced by how he was perceived by later philosophers, including Melissus. In fact, it is possible that some aspects of Parmenides' philosophy that are not explicitly found in his poem, or by some other direct statements from ancient authors about Parmenides, may actually more closely resemble Melissus than Parmenides. In that case, the description I gave about Melissus' view of reality may be inspired by Parmenides, but it may also be an innovation upon it. Or, in fact, Melissus may in some way disagree with Parmenides. Alright, so perhaps I was wrong about some detail about Parmenides and his philosophy, and presented Melissus' view as though it were Parmenides. That's when I was prompted to delve deep into the literature, and the deeper I got into the philosophy, and commentaries and academic articles, the more confused I became. Not to mention the fact that different philosophers have different opinions about how to distinguish between Parmenides and Melissus, and they all use very complicated words with three syllables or more. So I will do my best to explain the difference as I understand it. But just be aware that there are others out there that have different views on this matter, and you should avoid them at all costs if you want to sleep peacefully tonight. It appears that both Melissus and Parmenides were monists. Yeah, I think we got that. So far, almost all philosophers were monists, with the exceptions of Empedocles and Anaxagoras, who were either pluralists or perhaps something more nuanced. But Parmenides and Melissus being monists, that still tracks. But then Parmenides is often called a generous monist, and Melissus a strict monist. Strict monism is basically the idea that only one thing is allowed to exist, while generous monism, which has nothing to do with giving away stuff, by the way, but it has everything to do with allowing other things to exist, either outside of or with the one thing. Melissus' strict monism can be understood from the following quotes. Fragment 3 Further, just as it ever is, so it must ever be, infinite in magnitude. Fragment 5 If it were not one, it would be limited by something else. Fragment 6 For if it is infinite, it must be one. For if it were two, it could not be infinite. For then, these two would be limited by each other. Here you see that Melissus is thinking of the one the universe, everything, which can of course only be one and not two or three or any number of things. It is easy to understand and explain mathematically, though it is really difficult to reconcile it with our everyday experiences and observations. Going one step further, in fragment 7, which is quite a long quote, he applies this reasoning to pain and suffering perhaps the first of the pre-Socratics to attempt to answer this very human reality directly. Bluntly spoken, what he argues is that we as humans experience pain and loss because we are stupid. Pain and suffering come from losing something precious or gaining something terrible. Yet, the whole of reality cannot lose anything, nor can it grow or gain anything. And since we as humans are part of the one reality, we also cannot lose or gain anything. Hence, pain and suffering are merely illusions and we should break free from them. This may seem like a trivial side point, but I think, here, we see him laying the groundwork for much later philosophical work, including Platonism, Epicureanism, sometimes called Hedonism, and of course, Stoicism. 
philosophical traditions I may get to at some point, maybe in about 50 years at my current pace. But what about Parmenides? How and where is he different? Well, I said he was a so-called generous monist, which means, among other things, that he allows for other things to exist. And these other things are coterminous, but not consubstantial with the one? Huh? What? When we think of the one thing that encompasses everything, is that one thing material or immaterial? As in, is it made of something physical or not? Well, not according to Melissus, who said in fragment 9b that if it is one, it cannot have body or mass or material. For if it had body, it would have parts and would no longer be one. This may interact with some of Zeno's paradoxes that say that something physical, no matter how small or thin, can always be infinitely cut in half or have a front side and a back side, which are different. So in Melissus, the one is non-physical. And Parmenides also agrees. Melissus says that only the one can exist. For Parmenides, it is more nuanced. Melissus says that one thing must exist and only one thing can exist. Parmenides says that one thing must exist, but more than one thing can exist. You see, it's one thing to say that only one thing must exist. It's something else to say that only one thing can exist. Parmenides does allow for the possibility, but Melissus does not. That is what makes Melissus a strict monist and Parmenides a generous monist. Now the one is non-physical in nature, which means that it is possible for the physical world to exist also, together with and even in the same place as the immaterial world, but it would be made of a different substance. This is what is meant by coterminous, but not consubstantial. Coterminous means that something can exist in the same place. Consubstantial, which these two realities are not, would mean that two things are made of the same material. And so there are two worlds or realities, which can exist together at the same time and in the same place. One exists necessarily and is immaterial. The other exists potentially and is material and both exist at the same time and in the same place, yet are not made of the same substance. And in this way, Parmenides is actually laying the groundwork for metaphysics, or perhaps you could call it a spiritual world, which will come back in Plato and in Aristotle in rather different ways. Now let's end this video with one last thing about Melissus. At the beginning of this video, I said that Melissus is sometimes seen as the student of Parmenides. On the other end, we also have a tradition that Melissus in turn was the teacher of Lucippus, traditionally the founder of atomism. Who Lucippus was, what ancient atomism was like, and whether or not Melissus really was his teacher, we'll find out in the next video.